That 90s show is out now on Netflix, and I've got my review of the entire first season. You know, it's kind of funny when you think about it. That 70s show premiered in 1998 and took place in 1976, and that 90s show is premiering in 2023 and takes place in 1995, which means that that 70s show is actually closer to the 70s than that 90s show is to its setting in the 90s. This video is brought to you by Athletic Greens, the makers of AG1. Check the link in the description below for a special offer and stay tuned after this review for more details. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle here with my review of the 10 episode first season of That 90s Show, which is dropping today on Netflix. That 90s Show comes from the same company that brought you That 70s Show, a couple of creators in common, a new creative team, but the feel is still there. The team of writers and creatives behind That 90s Show are a hybrid of old and new, which is much like the show itself, because That 90s Show isn't looking to reinvent or reimagine anything. It feels like the tarps were just pulled off of the same sets that were used back when that 70s show was on the air, and it seems like production just kept rolling as if it had never stopped. It's not the same show as that 70s show, but also it pretty much is. The style of humor, the tempo, the tone, the pace, even the transitions are largely all ported over directly from the parent series. And I'm not really bringing this up as a negative, it's more as a frame of reference. I watched that 70s show when it was on the air, and I enjoyed it. I watched that 90s show, and because it is so similar to that 70s show, I also enjoyed this one. If you don't like multi-camera laugh track sitcoms, this is certainly not going to do anything to win you over and it's really curious because I think that the kids in that 90s show would watch this show on television but I don't know if their counterparts here in 2023 are going to be quite as interested because it is a bit of a throwback tonally to the old style of sitcom that you don't really see that much anymore. I think maybe this show was made for well, people like me that did watch that 70s show when it was on the air. Speaking of the kids in the show that 90s show has an air of believability because it cast actual teenagers in the lead roles. What a crazy idea. Like its parent program, that 90s show focuses on a group of six teenagers hanging out over the summer in Point Place, Wisconsin. Callie Haverda plays Leia Foreman, daughter of Eric and Donna, who's inherited not just her dad's basement, but his awkward energy as well. Desperate for some real teenage experiences, Leia is allowed to spend the summer with her grandparents in Point Place, visiting the same places and often smoking the same weed as her parents and their friends did. Haverda plays the comic scenes exceptionally well. She really is able to bring over that awkward, dorky energy that Topher Grace brought to the character of Eric Foreman really well. I think that she struggles a little bit Bit more when it comes to the straightforward dialogue, but she's got the character down, and I think with time and being more comfortable in the character, that she can be a little bit more comfortable with the other dialogue in the next seasons if there are more for this show. Ashley Alfterhide plays Gwen, who lives in Donna's old house next door. Gwen is a self-proclaimed riot girl, an era-appropriate 90s teenage feminist, who is a great lesson, actually, in how to make a character and their beliefs both show and age-appropriate. I know as soon as I said the word feminist that a lot of people raised their eyebrows or maybe even threw their computer against the wall, but this is not a case where it feels like there's a political message from the 2020s that's put into this show that's set into the 1990s. This actually feels like a character who in her teenage years at that time was part of a movement that was going on at that time and the show also references it it makes fun of it it acknowledges it it expounds upon it it doesn't feel like it's thrown in there it feels like an inherent and necessary part of that character Gwen's older half-brother Nate is your textbook dumb jock played by Maxwell AC Donovan with the required mix of heart and idiocy Nate's girlfriend Nikki who's played by Sam Morelos is too often cast in the Mila 
Mila Kunis slash Jackie Mold of having to react to Nate's stupidity. Nikki and Gwen get some bonding time in the second half of this season, and I hope that they continue to build on Nikki's character again if there are more seasons of this show, because I think that she was the one that got the least to do in this season. Rain Doy is the youngest cast member and character on the show. He plays Ozzy, who is the broadly comedic type of character in the tradition of Wilmer Valderrama's Fez from that 70s show. Ozzy is young and openly gay, always equipped with a zinger, most of which land, and Rain Doy is a confident comedic actor, even at his young age. The character of Ozzy, I'm sure I can kind of hear the think pieces being generated right now. Is this a realistic depiction of a teenage gay character in Wisconsin in the 90s? That's not really what this show is going for, but again, they actually deal with this. It's not just a quirky character thing for Ozzy. There is an episode that deals with this, and I think deals with it in a pretty straightforward and emotionally touching way. So again, this is something where some people might hear that one of the characters on that 90s show is gay and think that this is another example of, you know, over-politicization of a show that's not supposed to be that. That's really not what's going on here. These do feel like, yes, sitcom characters, but characters that are well-rounded enough that each of their aspects belongs to the personality that's been established. And then we have Mace Cornell as Jay, the Kelso of the group, though he can't be quite as dumb as Kelso was since Nate also has a corner on that market. There's a reason that this character is the Kelso of the group, and that is revealed early on. And Jay and Leia's flirtation, she wants to have the first kiss, he's a bit of a ladies' man, are they going to get together? That provides the spine of this season. The 10 episodes of that 90s show in season one are largely episodic, but there is an overarching story that takes you from point A to point B over the 10 episodes, and I think it's executed pretty well. It's a nice hybrid of the way that sitcoms used to have to be self-contained because they were week to week on broadcast television, but with a plot that advances enough so that if you binge watch the series, you also feel like you've been told a story from beginning to end. I liked all of these actors, and I liked their characters. Yes, they are very broad. They fit into that sitcom character archetype, but the casting works, which means that the characters work, and I think that you have a really good foundation going forward into season two, three, or however many more they're going to make. With Netflix, you never know. They may have already canceled the show by the time this review comes out, but Netflix also took out an insurance policy to make sure that that 90s show wasn't squarely on the shoulders of a largely unproven teenage cast, and that is the return of Red and Kitty Foreman, played by Kurtwood Smith and Deborah Jo Ruff. In case you don't remember that 70s show, Red and Kitty are Eric's parents. Leia is staying with them over the summer. And that 90s show promotes them pretty much to co-leads. They are in that 90s show as much as any other character. And I think that centering so much of the show on Red and Kitty was actually a really smart move. The two actors have not lost a step, and they bring even more world weariness, or in Kitty's case, eternal optimism, than they did on that 70s show. Much like the rest of the series, they also don't feel like recreations of Red and Kitty, but continuations. It feels like Red and Kitty have been up there living in Wisconsin this entire time off screen, and we've just happened to catch up with them again 20 years later. Well, I did my part, took care of the gift. Twenty (laughs) dollars. You did one thing. Good for you. I'm sorry I snapped. It's birthdays are fun. (laughs) It's going to be a long day. Kurtwood Smith and Deborah Jarup are actually two really, really good actors, and they know these roles, they own these roles, they can do these roles in their sleep backward and forward, and you can tell the writers really also give them both some great lines to work with, as good as anyone else's lines. I know a lot of people might have wanted to put them in the background because they are the adults, the authority figures, etc., but they know the comedic possibilities of these characters and these actors, and they use them wisely. Smith and Rep are listed as executive producers on that 90s show, and they deserve every dollar that they have earned for this season because I think that Kitty and Red are the glue that holds that 90s show together. Nearly every original cast member from that 70s show also returns, nearly every cast member. Some of them are only in one or two scenes. Some of them appear in one or two episodes, but this isn't a show that wants to promote all of the returning characters to co-lead status. That pretty much belongs only to Red and Kitty. They really do want to put the focus on these new kids and make you like them and make the show depend on them to succeed. And what better way to set these characters up for success than by replicating that original formula that made us 
like the original group of teenagers from that 70s show. Some people may be frustrated by how closely that 90s show adheres to the formula established by that 70s show, but I actually kind of found it oddly refreshing because the way that they do a lot of these revivals or whatever you want to call them is you're always looking for the swerve because it feels like creatives always want to put their own spin, their own touch, their own thing that says, well, this is what makes my version different. And I kept waiting for that. At first I thought that, well, maybe they're going to make Gwen and Leia a couple, but they don't do that they're just best friends and they don't really try to take these huge tonal shifts from the first one they don't try to kind of bait and switch you with the original 70s show for a couple of episodes and then a wholly different show for the last eight episodes no this is pretty much the same show that you know and love the 90s references are there but the show doesn't depend on them for all of the humor and all of the relatability the decades have changed but Point Place Wisconsin has largely stayed the same and the foremen still have apparently the best video ventilated and most soundproof basement in the entire state. How Red and Kitty don't know what those kids are down to up there in that cloud of smoke, I will never know. Eh, maybe they do know and they just don't care. That 90s show doesn't entirely stick the landing. I think the first half of the season is a little bit stronger than the second half. And some characters, like the foreman's neighbor Sherry, stray just a little too far into sitcomville, even for me. And as I mentioned, I think that the broadness of some of the characters might rub people the wrong way. There's also a plot twist that's introduced in the season finale that's obviously meant to carry over into season two that comes completely out of left field. I think that it could have worked if they had taken an episode or two to set it up instead of bringing it in about 10 minutes before the season finale ends. I think that they can recover from it, but it kind of puts a sour note on the end of a season that I thought had some pretty well-told stories. I also had a bone to pick about a scene that is set in a video store because as I mentioned, the show starts off in June of 1995 and there's a video store where in the background there are boxes on the shelf for Batman Forever, The Lost World Jurassic Park, and Con Air amongst other movies. And it's pretty impressive that those three movies would be in a video store considering that they were still in theaters or had yet to be released in June of 1995. But that's one of those things that movie nerds like me notice and nobody else really cares about. About. This isn't a show about subtlety or deep character work or details like having the right movies on the shelf at the video store. This show wants to make you laugh. It wants to give you a nice, pleasant half hour's diversion, and it largely succeeds. The joke ratio is pretty much the same as every other multi-camera sitcom that I can remember. 20% of the jokes are really, really good. 20% of the jokes don't work, and the rest are funny enough to move the show along until you hit another really good joke. And in a show about the 90s, the feel feel of that 90s show may be the most nostalgic thing of all. By the way, another funny thing that I noticed is they say in the pilot episode that Eric Foreman is 38 years old in 1995, which means that his character has gone from being one year older than me on that 70s show to two years younger than me on that 90s show. Anyway, those are my thoughts on that 90s show. What do you think? Are you going to be firing up Netflix to check it out this weekend? Let me know down in the comments below. And before I go, I'm going to thank the sponsor for this video, Athletic Greens, the makers of AG1. We are well into January, which means it is time to buckle down and really think about making better choices. And AG1 is an easy and delicious choice when it comes to giving your body what it needs. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, and more to help you start your day right. And it is super simple. I can either put a scoop right into a cup of water, or if I'm feeling adventurous, mix it into a shake for breakfast at home. Either way, it's a quick and tasty way for me to start the day off right and make sure that I'm supporting not only my gut health, but my immune system, my recovery, focus, and so much more. If you don't take a multivitamin or you've been trying to figure out which one to take, AG1 is a great choice because because it's full of high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. So right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Dan. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Dan, D-A-N to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Thanks to AG1 for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching. Be sure to stay tuned right here because I'll be back with more movie news, reviews, box office, and more very shortly. Until then, stay safe 
and I'll see you next time. Bye.